My name is Dennis Cohn. I earned uh, an MDiv here in 1978. I wondered how many years it would take to move from there up to this side of the podium. 29 years. So uh, some people make it more quickly than that. Uh, just last night, uh, I was uh, confirmed as the president of the Alumni Alumni uh, Council. Uh, this is my, well, <laughs> I think this is my first official duty. So we're off and rolling for uh, the next two years. Uh, glad that all of you can be here to continue to participate in this wonderful banquet of, uh, of resources uh, for mind and body and spirit and heart. Uh, this indeed is a very, very rich day. And, and my experience is any time uh, people connected with Harvard Divinity School come together, it is indeed a very rich day. Um, there's water available for people uh, that uh, need to uh, make sure you're not dehydrated. Uh, I'm told that this film lasts 84 minutes, so if you didn't take a bathroom break in the most uh, uh, recent time, uh, you'll have to calculate uh, how, how you want to time yourself there. Um, we will uh, introduce the panelists here in a minute uh, and then see this uh, film for almost an hour and a half and then the panelists will reassemble and, uh, and respond uh, to, uh, to this work and to uh, your questions. Um, the uh, producers uh, uh, we had hoped would be here, uh, Heidi Ewing and uh, Rachel Grady. Unfortunately, they need to be at the Kennedy Center for Recognition in Washington, D.C. this evening, so they're not with us. But I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, moderator, uh, April Yvonne Garrett, uh, MTS 97, founder and present, present President of Civic Frame, a nonprofit organization that uses media arts and scholarship to encourage civic participation, media liter literacy, and critical thinking. To this end, she has moderated discussions about works such as The Trials of Daryl Hunt, uh, Kingdom of David, uh, Saga of the Israelites, and Muhammad, Legacy of a Prophet. With wide audience, audiences, including key figures in government and non-governmental positions. Civic Frame's success is owed to Ms. Garrett's tailor-made programming on social issues of relevance locally, nationally, and internationally, and has earned her recognition as one of Maryland's top 100 women. Of her many projects and accomplishments, it is her role in Civic Frame that we highlight here today. Uh, Professor Harvey Cox, has been teaching here since 1965, both at HDS and in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, an American Baptist minister. He was the Protestant chaplain at Temple University and director of religious activities at Oberlin College, an ecumenical fraternal worker in Berlin, and a professor at Andover Newton Theological Seminary School. Uh, his research and teaching interests focus on interaction of religion, culture, and politics. Among the issues he has explored are urbanization, the theological developments in world Christianity, uh, Christian-Jewish uh, relations, and current spiritual movements in the global setting, particularly Pentecostalism. He is a prolific author. His most recent book is When Jesus Came to Harvard, Making Moral Decisions Today. And I heard Harvey talk about that with alumni in uh, Miami a couple years ago. That was a delightful evening. Um, his uh, book, Secular City, published in 1965, became an international bestseller and was selected by the University of Marburg as one of the most influential books of Protestant theology in the 20th century. Next, uh, Alexander Hurt, MTS 96, founder and pastor of Kingdom Church of God in Christ in Brockton, Massachusetts. He sees his early life as having uh, shaped and prefigured a commitment to social and economic justice for all, an ambition that has inspired him to study the effects that religious commitments have on shaping and forming social action to urban ministries while at Harvard. His work in the inner city of Boston has been covered by Boston new newspapers on CNN's Inside Politics, followed by a feature story on his life. He has recently heralded on the floor of the United States Senate as a leading voice on the issues of trade policy with Africa and urban policy. With recent addition to, of uh, Gabriel Elise to his family, he and his wife, Ty, are parents to five. 
And finally, Marla Frederick is Assistant Professor of African and African American Studies and the Study of Religion at Harvard. Her research interests include African American religious experience, political economy of the U.S. South, democracy and racial formation. Her monograph, Between Sundays, Black Women and Everyday Struggles of Faith, is an ethnographic study of accommodation and resistance theories as they relate to the practice of faith among Baptist women in the South. She received her PhD in cultural anthropology from Duke University in 2000, has taught at the University of Cincinnati and served as a visiting womanist uh, scholar at the International Theological Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Currently, she is engaged in research on the influence of religious media, more specifically television ministries on constructions of race and gender in the African diaspora. So we have uh, a, a wide-ranging, a very talented panel. Uh, first of all, we'll see this, uh, this movie, and then the panel will reassemble and uh, respond and later take your questions. Thank you.
Sorry, hello? Oh, that's, that's right. It's not on. It's not on. I'm so sorry. It's not meant to happen. I think it's just one. Is it meant to happen? Go ahead. It didn't break for the microphone. Break for the microphone. Let's break some property. OK. The synopsis according to the website. A growing number of evangelical Christians believe there is a revival underway in America that requires Christian youth to assemble leadership roles and advocating the causes of their religious movement. Jesus Camp follows Levi, Rachel, and Tori to Pastor Becky Fisher's Kids on Fire summer camp in Bevels Lake, North Dakota, where kids as young as six years old are taught to become dedicated Christian soldiers in God's army. The film follows these children at camp as they hone their prophetic gifts and are schooled in how to take back America for Christ. The film is the first ever look into an intense training ground that recruits born-again Christian children to become an active part of America's political future. My first question is for Professor Cox, who is uh, actually watching the film today for the first time. So um, what I wanted to pose to you, Professor Cox, is whether or not you felt like the filmmaker's intent was revealed in the film, and also, to a greater or lesser extent, did they get it right, or if not, what did they do wrong? Well, good. Uh, nice to have you back, April. Um, this was a very disappointing film for me, in part because I don't think there was much about Jesus in it. There's a lot of talk about Jesus, but uh, we missed the entire life of Jesus here. We had a lot of invoking of Jesus and, and so on, but what happened to the Sermon on the Mount? What happened to the human stories? What happened to the identification with the poor? Uh, what happened? Uh, it's all gone. It, there's a terribly reductive understanding of, of Jesus here uh, that has to do with a kind of invocation of his name uh, in, a, in a kind of ecstatic way, uh, and then uh, wedding that to a particular political agenda that I find uh, not present at all in the, in the actual life and ministry and teaching of Jesus. It's a real disconnect. Uh, I agree with the gentleman who said, however, also over here, I think it's a gross misrepresentation, distortion of, the, uh, even of evangelical Christianity in America. Uh, it's, uh, it's one small part of it. And in fact, one small part, which I think is really in trouble now, with reference to the rest of evangelical, uh, most of the rest of evangelical Christianity, which is an extremely varied and, and, and divided uh, movement. Uh, it was kind of amusing to see Ted Haggard there and, and, and <laughs> inveighing against uh, homosexuality when we know what happened to poor Ted shortly after this movie was made, I guess. He's, he no longer is heading that church because of, uh, I guess, uh, violating some of the things he was advocating in his preaching. Uh, I think we have here a couple caricatures. I think the framing of the film with the, with the uh, disc jockey, uh, the call-in show, he seemed to be uh, exaggerating in his own way and then talking, and then we, we see the, the movie, in which, which I think is a, uh, a, 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 is a reductionist exaggeration. I think we really need a very good film on evangelical, the evangelical movement in America uh, as, as well done, uh, artistically done, as this one, by the way. Uh, but uh, more, uh, much more accurate, much more comprehensive, 
much more nuanced about the different movements within it, uh, much up, more up to date about the changes that are going on it, and also a little bit more, if I may say so, a little bit more sensitive to the fact that the vast majority of black American Christians are evangelicals. We didn't see very many of them here. And the positions taken uh, politically and otherwise here certainly don't represent what the black churches uh, generally have been advocating. So uh, I, I admire the filmic artistry, in a way, of this film, but I wish it had been uh, more productively and accurately focused. Thank you. My next question is for Alex. Um, there are a ton of responses to this film, as you can imagine. Uh, anybody that watches this film will have a take on it one way or the other, and clearly, from whatever perspective you're coming from, you're going to enter into that space in, in uh, several different ways. There was an uncredited writer in the movie guide who called it a sarcastic documentary that paints evangelical, evangelicals, fundamentalists, charismatics, and politically concerned Christians as very shrill, warlike, and dangerous. Now, Ted Haggard, of course, had a response to the film, and his response included um, what he, him being very concerned with the fact that evangelical practices are seen as extraordinarily extreme. And uh, one of the most powerful quotes, I think, that he said about the reasons why he did not like the film, he said there were two reasons. First, that it portrayed the training of kids at the camp as militaristic, extreme, and scary, and two, which is really what I want you to focus on in your response. It forces non-charismatic evangelicals to say, that's us, it's not, it's that to them, it's not us. So I wanted you to sort of respond to that from your, your theological background and what you're doing with your ministry. Sure, if, if I could just go out for a second and then come right back into the question. I think that there is a very, we are at a very dangerous moment. And the danger is, of course, that the culture have re has replaced a culture of silence where these disagreements were simply not discussed in polite company with a culture of suspicion where there's all of this us and them language. You know, before I was a little late getting here today because I'm just getting back from Demopolis, Alabama where I preached for the last three, three nights at a major revival there. And every time, every night they introduced me, they, Alex Hurt, Pastor Kingdom Church in Brockton, Massachusetts, to which the entire crowd said, they're conservative Christians in Massachusetts. The reality is, is that for the heart of the nation, these beliefs are not foreign at all. The people who think that these beliefs are foreign are the people who are foreign. So th there is a, a, a real uh, silence and a, and, a, and a very dangerous culture of suspicion that has grown up within the American culture. And we have all these shorthand terms for it with red state, blue states, when the reality is is that the country's purple. And the, the degree to which we don't talk to each other, these problems become more intracted. It's not very much unlike, you know, the Barry Goldwater, you know in your heart I'm right. Uh, there has always been a kind of um, a, a, an agreement between portions of our nation not to talk about the, the deep-seated disagreements that we have. To this film, I really believe that, uh, you know, it's, it's full of caricatures. But to Professor Cox's point, uh, most religious movements uh, become movements because they highlight a particular brand of Bible. And so uh, to, to look at the uh, brand of Pentecostalism that this represents, uh, this represents to, to my mind uh, as a conservative evangelical who is a Pentecostal, um, there is nothing said or done in this film that I find scary or harmful or anything else. I feel very comfortable with what is taught and shared that uh, so much of the country has such strong, visceral uh, reactions against it, says the degree to which we really need to talk. And the reality is, is that whether it's played out in our political culture, which basically has made uh, mints for basically highlighting the ways that we disagree, or if it's played out in our 
urban culture in the way in which we simply don't talk about these things until they explode a la Imus. Uh, either way, we either are going to talk or fight. I choose talk. Thank you. Dr. Frederick, I wanted to pose a question to you. We, we've had conversations in the past, and I think one of the things that were, was striking for both of us as um, African-American women is the lens in which the documentary filmmakers, two females, chose with regard to race. There were several kids of color in this film. There were several adults of color in this film, and they weren't engaged. And I wanted you to speak, again, from your knowledge base about your perception of that in this film and how it shaped the story that was being told. Yeah, I, um, in watching the film, I've watched it a few times now, um, I'm amazed at kind of the way in which there's an invisibility of whiteness that one presumes that this logic, this religious doctrine is a universal kind of doctrine that covers all people when it is particularly, um, as, as expressed in the movie, very white and very um, heartland, um, capturing the heartland, if you will, as we imagine it. And that to me is troubling because it, doesn't, it does not allow for even the people who are experiencing, experiencing um, the type of Pentecostalism that ex is expressed in the, in the film, it doesn't allow them to see beyond a kind of myopic view of the United States um, so that people begin to even question their own whiteness or their own middle class standing. Why are these particular issues the issues that define what's the, prob the, the problem with America, right? Abortion or this question over evolution and creationism. Um, a second thing that, that um, struck me about the film as it relates to culture is the ways in which the film creates a kind of, or, or the, the, um, the community of believers represented in the film create a good and evil dichotomy, right? So that there are people who are good and there are people who are evil. There are people who are righteous and there are people who are not. And the way in which that's defined does not allow for, just speaking as an anthropologist, does not allow for a kind of creative, alternative way of addressing problems in society, right? So one can presume that this group of people would not ally with a labor movement, right? Or would not ally with people who are fighting against um, uh, even the issues that Liz Walker talked about in the Sudan today, right? This issue of genocide in the Sudan. Could they ally themselves with non-believers or the non-righteous in fighting against um, genocide in the Sudan? So the, the, the kind of stark contrast that they create against um, between the righteous and the unrighteous is extremely problematic for building a type of coalition that really could do the work that Professor Cox talked about, this work of Jesus in the world. So those are my, my thoughts. Now, um, the filmmakers couldn't be here today, and I, I wanted to make every effort to try to get to some of the, the questions that you may have um, with regard to how they did the film film work and, and what their intentions were, which is partially the reason why I started this conversation around the synopsis that they have on their website. But there's also um, an article that was in the Washington Post where they respond to folks who find Jesus Camp frightening. I just wanted to read you the quote. Um, Ms. Grady says that for folks who find Jesus Camp frightening, they may be missing an important lesson. She says that uh, the evangelicals are not doing anything illegal and explain that in fact they're embracing and utilizing democracy to its fullest potential. There's no office too small, no political position that is too insignificant to them. And if she were to say that she was scared of these people, then she would be saying that she would also be scared of the very tenets of our political system. Uh, Ms. Ewing also adds to that that the families and activists in the film don't consider themselves as political. To them, they're just living a moral and upright life in an organized way and to us, she says, that may look political, but they think that it is their duty to encourage the culture to live the same way, and that means engaging civically. As another footnote, it appears that uh, the very camp that we're talking about is no longer in existence. I'm trying to find that for you. Um, apparently, in November of 2006, 
uh, Pastor Fisher announced that she would be shutting down the camp um, indefinitely due to the negative reaction to the film. According to Reverend Fisher's website, the owners of the property used, the camp, used for the camp shown in the film were concerned about vandalism on the premises following the film's release and thus will not allow it to be used for any future camps. Fisher has said that the camp will be indefinitely postponed until other suitable premises can be found, but it will be back. So I wanted to kind of put those things out there before we open it up and we are looking forward to hearing your comments. So please make sure when you go to the mic that you also allow us to know who you are. Thanks. Hi, uh, Philippe Copeland, MTS, class of 99. Um, I'm so glad that you guys uh, took on the issue of race because I was going to bring it up. And I'm curious, um, hi. Um, <laughs> I'm curious about, um, in your understanding of certain flavors of fundamentalism, um, like they did talk a lot about creationism and abortion, uh, but we know that the Bible uh, was also used in a different generation to justify enslavement of Africans discrimination against African people, et cetera. And I'm wondering, um, how long before there's a revival of the curse of Ham concept? Because that's also in the Bible, that black people are inferior and that we're destined by God to be slaves. And is it just that people aren't interested in that, or they just haven't read that as much? But how long before people decide to say, that's also in the Bible, and our country isn't based on that either? And I'm just curious what you think. I have one quick response to that, and um, it is um, based on some research that I did last year in South Carolina about religious broadcasting, interviewing people about religious broadcasting. And um, one um, local white uh, leader who's a member of a Pentecostal church um, expressed to me that in watching religious broadcasting, um, he, he talked about, I talked about, I asked him about race, and um, his response in, in a broad sense was that he watches many um, African-American um, preachers on television um, and that they do a lot, a, a, a number of black and white televangelists do a lot of good work in Africa. And so I asked him to talk more about his response to that. And he said, well, I understand that one of the reasons Africa is so um, impoverished is because um, they've always worshipped these other gods, and as a result of worshipping those other gods, they have been punished. And so there's a way in which I think sometimes a kind of critical assessment of policy, political policy, foreign policy, um, and a, a kind of historicizing of the United States and other countries in the world is not taking place, and as a result, it leaves leaves people open to accepting kind of simplistic theology that gives a quick and easy answer to much more complicated conditions. I guess the only thing that, I, that I'd love to just throw into this is to not uh, place this film and, and the movement that this film seeks to uh, highlight in, in some stark relief as if this is a new movement. It's not. And the reality is, is even though, um, for example, I'm a member of the Church of God in Christ, a large Pentecostal denomination um, uh, in the United States, and uh, even though we have absolutely no disagreement between uh, the Church of God in Christ and the Assemblies of God, uh, they are pretty much, a, they're a 95% white movement, and we're a 98% black movement. And so the reality is, is even though there is shared agreement about Bible, there are still these cultural norms that have, that have interwoven themselves in the way in which theology is discussed and talked about. So what I would say to your question is, um, I'm not looking for a revival of an understanding of the curse, the Hamitic curse. It's already here. In fact, it's never really left. The, diff the distinction is that there has grown up alongside of it counter narratives, and those counter narratives seek to offset it. And so it's important, I think, for, for, for us to really take 
strong, strong stock that, you know, whenever we see a film like this, we always want to distance ourselves from it. Look at those people. Well, guys, guess what? This is our country. This is where we are. And we are greatly divided. If, this, if we took this film, this room, and we set it in Demopolis, Alabama, there would be, praise God, where do I sign my kids up for the camp? We're a divided nation. And the only way that you get out of that is dialogically. And so I just feel like that that's, that's an important, important part of what we have to do and share. Thank you. Um, I'm Nancy Rockwell, and I've been here at various stages over many decades. <laughs> um, my reaction is slightly different, and I appreciate some comments, maybe Harvey's, anybody's really. Um, I was listening to the emotional tone, uh, which is very much the same as I hear on uh, in many movements, which is the core of who I am is someone standing up against my enemies. And that's the most important thing I have to do, win this battle. It's about victory and battle and all of that. Whereas when I read the scriptures, Jesus is inviting people to enter into wonder and imagination and into a transformation that moves them out of that very scenario. But I don't, it certainly wasn't part of this movie at all, this teaching at all. It's also not part of Cindy Sheehan, and it's not part of most movements that I've encountered in life. And there's a tendency of people to move, even in question and answers with speakers, to statements about moral righteousness rather than a statement inviting the speaker, take me further on a journey. It's, here's my moral righteousness speaker. Will you please salute it? Um, what does this have to say about faith? Yeah, well, I, I think it, uh, we, we are an institution here uh, at, at Harvard University in which uh, we are often very uh, uncomfortable with displays of emotion, uh, except at uh, football games and, and some riotous uh, faculty meetings when we're discussing what to do with the president. Then we can, then we can uh, let the emotion go. Uh, there are, uh, I see nothing wrong, in fact, I find it rather attractive that people are getting emotionally into their religious convictions and expressions. Uh, I, there's, there's nothing wrong with that uh, at all. And it's, it's perfectly normal. It happens in all religions around the world. We have something called ecstatic utterance in other religions than Christianity. These, what they call speaking in tongues here, uh, is, is a deep expression of a kind of emotion which is so powerful that it can't even be expressed in normal linguistic uh, modes. Uh, and I, I, I see nothing wrong with that. Uh, I still want to repeat, however, that what we have here is a depiction of a particular movement, even uh, within the uh, very broad evangelical movement in America, which is black and white, and also, by the way, very Hispanic. There are a lot of Hispanics in America who are even, who we didn't see any that I saw here. We saw a few black kids, but not. So it's, it's, a, it's a segment, and it's a segment with a particular uh, uh, agenda. I'm not even sure two or three years later they have the same agenda. I don't think they'd be putting President Bush's picture up there. Now, they're pretty sick and tired of them. He's, very, he's disappointed them. He, if he's, if he's uh, surrounded himself with spirit-filled people, one of them, Scooter Libby, is just being carted off to jail today. Uh, so something went wrong there. there there's a, the, I think the bloom is off the rose as far as this, uh, ex, this loyalty to a particular political program. To which I think one should also add that uh, in, the, in the movement that you, you saw Ted Haggard's megachurch there in, in Colorado Springs, look at the other leaders of megachurches, like Rick Warren who is in fact leading an effort to combat AIDS in Africa, who has signed up a whole range of evangelicals to do something from a Christian evangelical perspective about global warming. Uh, we didn't hear anything about them. So there's, there's a vast generalization going on here, which I think could leave us with a mistaken impression. Uh, no doubt there are divisions, but there are also some divisions within this movement 
uh, that, uh, and uh, I think I, I, I agree with Maria that simply setting this up as a kind of a A versus B, or black and white dual dualism, is uh, not going to get us anywhere uh, either. Bob Chestnut, MDiv 62, PhD 74. I agree with the judgment that the religion represented here is a distortion of the way of Jesus. And I agree with the uh, view that politically it's black and white thinking is frightening. But I also strongly disagree with the implications of the liberal commentator that these people have no right to express their views politically. That sword cuts two ways. And if they don't have a right to express themselves politically, then... Right, right, the liberal commentator in the video, right. Uh, if those right-wing religious folks have no right to be political, then we progressive Christians don't either. It doesn't work that way. I just have a couple comments. First of all, I could make... I'm a Lutheran pastor, Paul Block, in the Bronx, and... I could make a pretty funny movie about uh, the Lutheran church. That, uh, and secondly, I have prayed over my copy machine many times in my church <laughs> in pure desperation. Did um, it work? Did it work? No. <laughs> well, actually it did. It got, it, in God's time, I figured out tricks how to get the machine to work, so it, it, it didn't come right away. The reason I'm sort of uncomfortable watching the movie here, and I don't know if this is necessarily the best, you know, we, we've learned about so many wonderful films over the, the last uh, 24 hours and you know I, you, you leave Harvard and you're in the real world and you're talking and, and you're you know I am a I consider myself an evangelical Christian and there's a sense that we're sort of laughing at these people and I don't know if this movie itself was worthy of dialogue as you say I mean it seems like it's pretty much watching people that have a fear-based engagement with the world, and the movie itself was sort of trying to instill fear in the rest of us. That's the Alito thing, I think, was to instill, look at how powerful these people are. They got Alito elected. Um, so I, I think we, I don't know how much this movie pushes us closer to dialogue. Are we, are, I want to make a, a, a comment, and I want you ch to guys to chime in. Are we assuming that the theological underpinnings of this movement doesn't use sort of fear as a foundation for, you know, buttressing a stronger faith base? I mean, I think that part of the, the complication with this film is that the way that these people interact with the world every day is based on a worldview that they are really, you know, fortified in by everything that they do, from the homeschooling to who they interact with to what they're listening to on the radio. And so they are really, in the same ways that we, who may be more progressive, surround ourselves with progressive things, people, newspapers, NPR, et cetera, et cetera, they are also forming it in that way. So That's why I think the movie maker and, and the Air America guy were also instilling fear. Sure. In, uh, and, and shaping it. Yeah. Okay. I have two comments. One is more of a question, but I said I felt sad about the children. I think mostly because it seemed that these young children were so racked with guilt in this video, and that was what I found troubling. Not so much that they were so faithful and passionate, but that the, the tears were, it was gut-wrenching to watch, that um, they were meant to feel so guilty for um, the things that they had done. So I'd be interested to talk a, a bit more about that. Someone brought up um, the question of abusive children. But I wanted to hear more about the issue of dialogue because I struggle with that. Um, I think the Chris Hedges book deals with it in a, in a better way, demarcating evangelicals who um, do not feel this way and then evangelicals who are incredibly politically motivated and incredibly intolerant so how do i uh i'm a rising second year mts student here i forgot to say that um how do i enter into, into a conversation with someone like levi who feels icky just being in my presence because i haven't been saved it, it i struggle with that i'm not quite sure how to approach right, the situation that, uh, to your point i think he probably would struggle with that as well 
It's the, the, to uh, just, if I can just underline something that Professor Cox raised, and that is the dynamism within the religious world. There is a religious pluralism in America with different faiths, but within these faiths, there's a dynamism that's there as well. So it's, the, the question is much more complex than how do we get people who are uh, progressive uh, evangelicals or progressive Christians speaking to conservative Christians. The question is actually much more complex in that how do we even get conservative Christians talking among each other? Because they're people who have very, very strong disagreements. I was uh, talking uh, to Professor Fedrick before we started up, and she was saying that she knew someone from the uh, Pentecostals Assembly of the World, where they're a oneness denomination. When I grew up, I'm a Trinitarian Pentecostal. Now, the difference between us is about a word in a sentence in a doctrinal statement. However, I grew up learning these people are the enemy. You don't talk to PAW people. You certainly don't marry PAW people. You don't, you, don't, you don't have dinner. You don't convert with PAW people. And then you come to a place like Harvard, and you, know, uh, you meet people who are not just PAW, but you know, I mean, they're, they're people who you're really not supposed to talk to. So I think, <laughs> so, so I think the, only, the, only way, the only way that we do this is by conversations like this, where we actually humanize the other if we could use some Harvard language for a second. And the only way to humanize the, the other is to actually admit the metaphysical possibility that people who disagree with us could potentially be right. That's the place to start. And then to see the passion of, the, of, the, of, of these brothers and sisters, to see their passion as heartfelt and principled. By humanizing them, that's the only way you're going to be able to dialogue. And, and I think that's the place to start. In, I, I, I'm hopeful about it happening, and I'm very interested in these conversations, but I actually think that the clock is being rolled back and not forward. Uh, I can remember when uh, Harvard Divinity School was first uh, given a sum of money to establish a chair of Catholic studies here. This was uh, maybe 30 years ago. And there are many people on the faculty and student body who said, we can't do that. You can't talk with those people. They just do what the pope tells them to do, or the bishop tells them to do. Well, luckily, we ignored that and went ahead and, and, and have a, not only a professor of Catholic studies, but we have three or four Roman Catholics on the faculty, and now a, uh, uh, one or two Jewish professors, a Muslim, two Muslims, and a Buddhist. Uh, we are trying to do something here about, uh, about uh, communication, listening to people who are different from you. And yes, we now have a chair of evangelical studies. Uh, it took a while to get that. Uh, people said the same thing. You can't talk with those people. Why even try? In this very room where we're sitting, some years ago, we had a wonderful exchange. You were here for that, I think, uh, with a delegation of people from, uh, from Regent University and uh, Pat Robertson's University in uh, Vir Virginia Beach. We had uh, a, a exchange among faculty, and then in this, we had this place was jammed, talking about how to apply religious values in public life. We talked with each other, we disagreed, but we, we did what you said, we, we listened with the possibility, just the mere possibility, you may be right. If you, don't, if you don't have that, at least as part of the attitude that you bring to such a conversation, it's not gonna happen. Now, I, I'm, uh, I'm very confident in the, in the possibility of, uh, of conversation and dialogue. Maybe I'm too idealistic about that. But I think it can happen. And I, I don't think we should, we should uh, deal anybody. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll project. I don't think we should count anybody out at the outset. I'm for inviting everybody to the table and trying to con con create conditions under which all those who come to the table uh, feel comfortable to be there and feel heard having, having been there. Uh, so uh, I, I, one of the, one of the, one of the my, my last point here is we're very big on interfaith conversation. Uh, we have the Center for the Study of World Religions. We have, we're all in favor of interfaith. A lot of people are a little more apprehensive about what I call intra-faith. 
conversation. That is talking with those within our own tradition who differ with us quite fundamentally uh, on various things. Uh, it's a little too close to home, maybe. Uh, it's a, a little uncomfortable. But I wish we could have uh, uh, some of each, intra and inter. We have, we have time for one more question. Yeah, the, the, the issue that I wanted to raise, I'm Leonardo Radamile, MDiv07. The issue that I wanted to raise to emphasize what Alex and Professor Cox has been saying is Harvard is not a congenial place for one who is either Pentecostal or evangelical or is outside of the mainstream liberal culture. For example, Levi may feel yucky speaking to Christians, or excuse me, speaking to non-Christians, but I find the majority of students at the Divinity School and many on campus feel very yucky speaking to Pentecostals and people who have a very, very different point of view than they do. Uh, any religion is going to make truth claims. And, you know, Houston Smith says, you know, the function of religion is certainty and transcendence. And that doesn't mean that people who have strong truth claims are stupid. I mean, I preached the men's sermon at the largest African-American church in New England, Jubilee Church, and I had three Rhodes Scholars there in the audience. And these are not stupid or unnuanced people, but on theological issues would agree virtually uni unanimously with what was being portrayed there. But the way it was being portrayed and the way it was being presented was as something that was stupid and dangerous. And just as a little coda to that, Samuel Alito is one of the most sophisticated jurists in the United States. He was supported by a large number of the faculty at Harvard Law School. To, to see him or to conclude that he's the result of some vast rights-wing conspiracy is absolutely ridiculous. We've got to talk about these things, and we've got to respect each other. I wanted to take this opportunity to allow the panelists to have one final thought. Uh, I don't know how uncomfortable uh, Pentecostals are uh, at Harvard Divinity School. Alex could probably say that. Um, I don't think the ones that I met didn't see. I don't, you never seemed uncomfortable to me. You seemed pretty, uh, pretty confident most of the time I saw you, Alex. Uh, I, th I think our job, however, is to create the atmosphere in which nobody feels so uncomfortable, if possible. Uh, and I think that I, I, I insist that I think that can be done. It's a matter of the way the conversation is arranged, the expectations of those who enter into it. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think we can't give up on that. We have to find ways to make that happen. And we're trying here with, with endowed professorships, with courses. Uh, I think you took my course on Pentecostalism, which was itself a wonderful example of conversation among people who were Pentecostals and not Pentecostals, about half and half, as I recall. recall. And nobody was, uh, you know, nobody was at anybody's throat that I can recall. At least not while I was watching. <laughs> it can be done. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm good at projecting. I'm a black preacher. <laughs> I'll pass the plate later. I, I think that um, just to um, just to just to go to the point that was raised earlier about whether or not I, I I just can't leave this comment out in the air about whether or not. Alito was part of a right-wing conspiracy. Well, he was. I mean, I'm part of it. Uh, there is a, there, there, the country is divided. It's divided. And everyone feels like there is an absolute assault. The left is conspiring about putting their people in place and taking over school boards and taking over city councils and taking over mayorities. And guess what? So is the right. And so there, it, it, it is a very dangerous moment, but I think it's also a great moment for opportunity. And what better place to have that kind of conversation than, than right here at Harvard? During my time here, um, as a very, very conservative uh, Christian, uh, Pentecostal, it was often the case that what I needed to do was to kind of explain what, what, I, what I felt, but I'm very comfortable at doing that. I, I can't imagine somebody being uh, surrounded by people who are in, in some ways not like them, but at least welcoming and interested. I was the star of the campus, <laughs> so it was great for me. It did a lot for my ego. I'm looking to come back. And so, you didn't need much to help out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
So I do, appre- I do appreciate this opportunity, and I pray that this will spark something. Uh, my final thoughts. Um, one, I do think that there is this problem with the film that's been touched on consistently, um, just about their portrayal of evangelicals, right? So that we have this image of a particular group of evangelicals, which is fine to study a particular group, but the filmmaker needed to do a better job of placing it in a larger context, right? And so not giving us just this image of Ted Haggard with the subtitle president of the National Association of Evangelicals. So then we can then presume this is what evangelicals do. So that that was um, a problem. Um, At the same time, just in thinking about the, the young people that were in the film and their passion um, and the ways in which their, their faith and their spirituality was taken so seriously by their teachers and the way they took their own spirituality so seriously um, was somewhat um, encouraging in light of the context of a larger youth culture that many people believe um, is just kind of um, uh, cynical, um, to draw on even a word that was used earlier at the luncheon. Um, at the same time, that... Um, that youth culture has great potential in resisting peer pressure. And I say this because this is a paper that I've been thinking about writing. Um, I have a, um, the friend that we were talking about, my um, best friend from growing up is a um, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, a member of Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. And I've never met someone who's more kind of secure in her own person and has the ability to kind of resist cultural assumptions about what she should and should not do, right? So then the youth in the film have an ability, and and I think about this for the young girls that were in the film, for the images of women in the media that are constantly being portrayed, that they have another way of thinking about themselves and resisting um, kind of cultural kind of assumptions about who they should be in the world. Um, At the same time, I think it's really important for them as well as for, and I say this for conservative Christians as well as for more liberal Christians um, and people who consider themselves secularists to to do just what we were talking about and that is expose oneself to other people's perspectives and understandings of the world because that is the only way that we can enter into this very real dialogue um, that we've been talking about. So those are my, my closing thoughts. One of the things that I wanted to do in the beginning by placing the trash bag in front of us is for us to get off of our chest the visceral responses we had to this film. I know when I first watched the film, it was, I had to stop it actually and then start again because of my own personal history as a former black Baptist and now as a UCC. So all of you who know that, that's a a major theological leap (laughs) from something a little bit more, less progressive to something that's a lot more progressive. But Part of what I have to do also as a moderator is to take myself out of it and to empathize with the people that we're seeing. And so what I'm asking all of us to do in the future, because we have so much knowledge in this room, we have experiences that other folks don't have. When we start to open up and talk about these issues and talk about things that make us a little bit uncomfortable, to have a little bit more empathy, to try to put ourselves in their shoes, and then make our comments with a little bit more grace and a little bit more compassion, as you all did today. We thank you so much. We have a wonderful commencement worship service that's about to begin at 4.30, and we hope you join us. And again, thank you, Harvard Divinity School, for a wonderful day about film and art and religion.